Amen. If you don't have a sermon outline, please lift your hand. We have men that are here in the middle. Just lift it up good and high, especially if you're new to us this morning. Maybe you didn't know you need one. Um, The message will make so much more sense as we study the Bible um, together. And uh, this morning we continue with our second message in the book of Philippians. The last Sunday we were in uh, the first couple of verses of Philippians, and this morning we come to the second message of Philippians, and it's entitled, The Fellowship of the Church. If you're clicking online to uh, watch this message online, if you go to our church website, um, away from YouTube, but over on the church website, you can find the notes where you can download them, and uh, there's some with blanks or there's some with answers, whatever is helpful to you. But I want to encourage you as you join us in that way. The fellowship of the church. We find this in Philippians in such a glorious and beautiful way. Let's review for just a moment before we launch into this picture of fellowship. First of all, last week, and notice there under the review, we said that the letter of Philippians is a, what did we say, a most loved and a most quoted book of the New Testament. I've left those in for you. Now, we had a warning after the most quoted and a most loved. And part of the idea is we quote a few verses out of Philippians so often that it is, it is tempting for us to lift them out of context. We, we can lift them out of the context of the whole letter, and that's a dangerous thing to do with the Word of God. I want to encourage you that God's Word makes plenty of glorious sense, makes full sense when we have it in its context. You can stay right there with it. It is just as powerful. You don't need to lift it out and exalt it in a way that was not intended. And that's sometimes what we can do when we don't study verses in context. That's part of the value of studying the Bible um, book by book as we're doing here in the life of our church. So first of all, it's one of the most loved and most quoted. We want to make sure that we have the right context as we study. Number two, it was written by Paul near the end of his life as he awaited what? Execution in prison in Rome. What this reminds us of is the stark reality of Paul's circumstances. It reminds us that this letter that has not one hint of negativity in it, not one hint of despair in it, not anything that has to to do to recognize all of the, all of the in just really ominous circumstances around his life. He's in a prison, he is condemned, and he's waiting on execution. But instead, we see all of these beautiful, glorious challenges of joy and rejoicing and beautiful humility of the glory of God coming and working in our hearts and what he's done in us and a great love for the saints. And so this is, this is an important reminder that this is being written by a guy in prison. Number t- three, um, Paul first visited Philippi about 10 years earlier and planted a church there. I hope you went back and spent a little bit of time in Acts 16 this week. Our staff did together on Tuesday morning. And in fact, I, was, I enjoyed going back through Acts 16 with the staff as we were just kind of taking it out and handling it. The story about Lydia and how she came to faith outside the city, you know, God just opened her heart. And then we see this demon-possessed girl that's following Paul around and saying, these are the men of the Most High God. You know, by the way, um, false teachers and deceivers, they do their job the best when they add a lot of truth to their message. And that is the danger of false teachers and deceivers, either preachers right here in town or preachers on the television or on the internet or people that, people that are just everything that Jude describes, everything that Timothy is warned of, everything that we see in 1 Corinthians and in other places. We, we, we see that part of what makes a dangerous false teacher a really dangerous false teacher is that he, he works in a lot of truth in his message. And that's what we see the demon-possessed girl doing. She is saying, these are men of the Most High God. Now, her life is not reflecting that. Her life is reflecting the occult. Her life is reflecting demonism and, and satanic other lifestyle and message and all of that. But she is, she's chasing the guys around until Paul turns around and says, depart, come out. 
And, um, you know, they're, they're, we're going to study that at a later time and why he would do that. But not only, not only Lydia and the demon-possessed girl in Acts 16, but this is Paul's first visit to Philippi, and it's 10 years before this letter is written. We also see what? We see Paul beaten with rods, Paul and Silas beaten with rods. They're thrown into a prison, an earthquake comes. They're miraculously released, but yet they do not flee because God has a plan to work in the jailer's life. And that jailer comes to faith in Jesus. And that jailer comes and his whole family is um, brought in and baptized as they come to faith in Christ. This glorious supernatural works as Paul is, is preaching the gospel in this city 10 years earlier. Notice number four. Philippi was a Roman colony in Macedonia or Greece. So there, there, there was a lot of weird things going on in their social structures there. There were major social issues. That's all we're going to say for now. There is, you, you, you talk about major conflicts. You talk about major disparities. You talk about, I mean, there, people coming in imperialism being handed down in the city and different classes of people all of these pressures were there, and many of them were aimed at the, Phili at the Philippian church who had come to faith in Jesus. The surrounding city, the surrounding people and culture were, were putting massive pressure on them, um, some of it just in their society, but some of it aimed at their Christianity. Number five, the Philippian church was under great pressure of persecution and economic hardship. Um, some of them were near starving in the Macedonia area. This was a time of great economic depression and, um, that, that had brought about by some famines that are in secular history and secular records. We know that there was a lot of trouble in that area. And here were Christians in the midst of that pressure cooker of trouble. And that's who Paul is writing to in the midst of their trouble as he is in the midst of his trouble in Rome. Look at number six. We recognize verses one and two, the introduction. And I want us to read those up there at the top. Look what it says in verse one. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. So it's first of all the writer, Paul and Timothy, who's with him, servants of Christ Jesus or slaves of Christ Jesus. And then the next part there, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. So this is the church. Look at number verse two. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the, the glorious greeting of saying, God sustaining strength to you, his grace to you, and his peace amidst the turmoil is to be yours from God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we said these things. Number one, we noticed the centrality of Christ last week. Three times it says Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus in those first two little verses. Jesus is the center of the Scripture. Jesus is the center of Philippians. Jesus is the center of Paul's hope. The second thing we see is the humility of Paul and Timothy. He calls himself a servant. Really, the word there is doulos, which means slave. And in fact, um, I put an extra note on here. Just circle that Exodus 21, 5 through 6. I encourage you to go home and read those two verses um, maybe this afternoon as part of your review of the sermon. I hope you do that on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening before you go to bed. If you'll just review this one time, it'll really stick a lot more in your heart. Pray through it. But it's interesting. In Exodus 21, it says, Concerning slaves in the Jewish nation, it says, if, there, if there's the relationship where you're, you're about to release a slave or there's this relationship between a master and a slave, when the slave says, no, I don't want to be released from my master. I love my master. That slave, it says, take him to the doorpost of the house and take an awe and bore a hole in his ear. And everyone will know from then on, this slave is bonded to his master in love. So this slave and his wife and his kids are bonded to this master. He's saying, I don't want to go anywhere. Now, my friends, that's, that's a bit of the picture that we see here when Paul and Timothy say, hey, 
We're slaves of Christ Jesus. They're saying, this is a hearken back to the Exodus picture of, oh, we're slaves because we have a good master and he owns us because he bought us with his own blood. This is how good our master is. So it's not a slave out of compulsion. It's not a slave out of legal um, requirement. It's not a slave out of obligation in this sense. It's a slave out of love. We challenged last few times we've seen a greeting like this. That it is a great thing for you to say, I am a bond slave of Jesus. I do not want to be separated from my master. He is a good and righteous master, and he is a patient, loving father. And so that's kind of the picture of Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves of Christ Jesus. We talked about not only the centrality of Christ, humility of Paul and Timothy, but the spiritual identity of the people who are receiving the letter. Notice what it says there in verse 1. It says, to all the saints. Remember that? To all the saints, the people have been made holy. And how are they made holy? Not through their works. But saints are only made saints because of Jesus' work. It says, in Christ Jesus. Circle in Christ Jesus. Up there at the bottom of verse 2. It says, in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi. And so this is how people are made saints, not declared so by a council of bishops or cardinals or um, a pope. It is not, that is not the picture of a saint. And it's not someone who never sins. It's someone whose sins are forgiven. Um, this is what a saint truly is. And so there's, here's the review from last week. And now we come to a glorious, glorious passage in verse 3 through 8. And um, I, there's a concept that I want to first give you three quick illustrations that I think that you will find very um, helpful, I hope. How many of you, um, how many of you have studied World War II at all? How many of you have studied World War II? Pro- probably almost all of us have studied World War II to some degree. How many of you have kind of found yourself interested in World War II? I admit it. I, I'm interested in World War II. But my, both of my grandfathers were in World War II, and I spent a lot of time with my grandfathers. So I would, I would talk to them. They would talk about the war years. They would talk about those things. We, we know about the Normandy invasion in 1944, just a, a, a year before the, the war would come to an end. In fact, it would bring about the end of the war when the landing craft would leave Britain and go across the English Channel and men would topple out of those landing craft and invade northern France. Thousands upon thousands of men. That, that picture right there, it means a lot to me, just in general, because my great uncle Addis Coleman was one of these men. And when the door came down and he stepped out, he immediately stepped into water over his head and he drowned, um, was my uncle Addis. So he was, he was right at the beginning, and the landing craft stopped early. They, they think it would either hit a sandbar or one of the, one of the things that the Germans had put to stop boats from coming ashore. And with all of the weight on, he went right to the bottom. Um, so, you know, we got, a little bit of, we got a little bit of meat in this game and that in our family. And I, and I just think about that invasion that had been really masterminded by Winston Churchill. It's probably another reason why. I, I did 3,000 ships involved ultimately in the course of things. Well, there was a ship where it had a very young chaplain on board, and his name was Broughton Knox. So he was a Christian pastor. He had been brought into the British Navy, and he served on board a British ship um, during that time. And um, I want you to kind of hear a little bit about his experience. He was chaplain on board the ship during um, the last part of the war for the Brits. And he, he noted that leading up to the Normandy invasion on D-Day, the minds of all hands on board, regardless of their rank, whether they were, whether they were an enlisted guy or whether they were an officer or whatever, regardless of their rank, they were all focused on the invasion's success. No one thought of his own interests, he said. He said, but only on how we could, we could work together as shipmates in their common task for success. He said, 
I remember noting how I had never been happier as when we were on board that ship getting ready and everyone working together. But after the invasion and the ship returned to England and other duty, everyone on board noticed a difference in the atmosphere on board. It was still friendly because it was a well-run, well-led ship. But he said several sailors came to him and said, this is not the same as it was. Our camaraderie is not like it was. Why is it, they asked the young chaplain, what changed? And I want you to see on the screen what he said. He said, what changed? The answer is quite simple. During those months that preceded and followed D-Day, our thoughts had a minimum of self-centeredness in them. We gave ourselves to our shared activity and objective. Once the undertaking was over, we reverted to our own purposes as we normally do. And so that, that bit of excitement and just locking together was a bit lost. For me, as a student of World War II, there's another vivid example that even comes out of that. And the story, the true story of Band of Brothers is, is on my mind. Many of you have seen that series. Um, it was, it was done with actors, no doubt about it. Those actors, we kind of got used to seeing their faces and we, we learned their characters. But each one of those actors actually represented real men that were in Easy Company of the 101st Airborne. And before each episode of that miniseries, you would see the actual men who Easy Company had, um, who the story was being told of their lives, were being interviewed. And over and over and over again, you heard those men describe what battle did to their relationships. So much so that the entire series would wind up being named, what? A band of brothers. Some guy from Louisiana that becomes best friends with a guy from New York, that becomes best friends with a guy from California, that becomes best friends, friends with a guy from South Carolina and Illinois. This, this eclectic group brought together under the pressure of a common task and under the pressure of a great danger and under the pressure of a great goal that 60 years later they would still talk about one another as if it was just yesterday that they would be together. There are men in this room who remember that from battle either in Korea um, or in Vietnam. We have men in our room that because of the Gulf War and because of things that we've been involved with even recently, that they can share this kind of bonding because of such a great and dire need and a great and dire task under such great and dire danger. Well, there's a third example that just I cannot escape from, and it's the story of the Lord of the Rings. You remember the Lord of the Rings is made up of three volumes, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. But it's that first volume that is entitled the Fellowship of the Ring. And what is the Fellowship of the Ring? It's not, it's not talking about the ring itself, but it's talking about those who made up the fellowship of them. And you remember with me in this story that there are four hobbits. These are tiny beings with large, hairy, shoeless feet. And they begin with Frodo Baggins and Merry and Pippin and my favorite, Sam. And these little, tiny Hobbits are linked with two great men of valor, two great fierce warriors, Boromir of Gondor and Aragorn, son of Arathorn II and king of Gondor. These two powerful warriors, brave warriors with these little tiny hobbits. And then there's one great powerful wizard, Gandalf, the ancient foe of evil in a repository of great wisdom and power the one who they look to so often for the key moment of decision and wisdom and deliverance. 
But on the other side of Gandalf is the elf Legolas, from a fair race of master archers with pointy ears. He moves with incredible grace and precision as he is a key part of the battle in a skill over strength. And lastly, there's the dwarf, Gimli, who is a stout, hairy, axe-wielding little creature from the dark chambers of the under mountains, and he has no idea that he's half the size of any of the warriors. <laughs> Never occurred to him. And we see this strange band all together, and it becomes a fellowship, a fellowship with a common task, a great task that is against all odds. You see, these nine members of the fellowship of the ring had few common likes, abilities, or preferences. The elves and the dwarves were like the English and the French. Both had an unspoken agreement of superiority over the other. Think about the English and the French. To this day, that rivalry exists far after the Hundred Years' War. But all of them came bound together by their great mission to defeat the forces of darkness and to save Middle Earth. They became inseparable, and their covenant commitment to one another was dissolved. It was disavowable. It, it couldn't be dis dissolved. It was, it was absolutely intact. In fact, Boromir, the valiant warrior, would give his life for the little hobbits. They're little hobbits, mind you. And the elegant archer, Legolas, would form so great a bond with Gimli that the dwarf, that he would be introduced, Gimli would be introduced to the great and honored order that was reser reserved only for the elves. So these unspeakable differences, these differences that would have never allowed them to truly work together were brought together because of a glorious task that was put in front of them. It was a fellowship. I want you to see on your outline the nature of a true fellowship. We see this highlighted throughout the New Testament, but we especially see it in the book of Philippians. And here's some things that we can start to understand about fellowship. First of all, think this term, fellows in a ship. They are going somewhere together. They are on a task. They are on a journey. They have a purpose. They are hemmed in together. They can't leave. The picture is that, they, that, that there is danger outside and they are together in this fellowship is is this bonding together. And we also need to recognize that fellowship goes beyond friendship. Fellowship is more than friendship. While friendship is usually found through common affinity or preferences, fellowship occurs through a common cause or goal. So I'm going to let you kind of think about that a little bit. You know, when we're, when we're good friends with someone, we may, we may or may not have fellowship with them. Maybe, maybe it's that we're really into model airplanes, or maybe it's we're, we're really into cooking, or we're really into talking about parenting, or we're really into our dogs, or our cats, or our animals, or we're really into golf, or sports, or a certain team. Or maybe we're really into our jobs, and so we, we have this common affinity. Or maybe we like the same kinds of foods, or the same kinds of entertainment. And so we strike up relationships that have to do with what is a common likeness. And there's some great things in that, and there can be some great friendships that come out of that. But what we begin to see in the book of Acts is that there is an ultimate relationship that goes far beyond a mere affinity of same likes. It has to do with the same raison d'etre, or reason to believe, to be. It's a reason to live. It's a reason to die with a common cause. And so, it's amazing that fellowship occurs through a common cause or a common goal, and it flourishes. It really grows through the joint pursuit. Fill that in, the joint pursuit of it. 
This is where the bonding really happens. This is where, because everybody is on board the ship, getting the ship ready to support the D-Day invasion, and because there is no task too great, there's nothing that is too great to be asked from the captain to the crew, and the crew says, yes, sir, make a way, we'll do it. We, we, we're together in this. It's not saying, oh, that's not my job, or it's, no, I'm too tired, or no, I'm not going to do that. It's simply, yes, sir, I'll get out of the way, let's go. The picture is there is a bonding through that, a band of brothers, a fellowship of the ring. Fellowship is most experienced, fill this in, when a common identity is infused and a common purpose is pursued. So a common identity is infused and a common purpose is is pursued. Think about 101st Airborne. They, as they began to train those men, as they began to bring them together, they began to say to them, you are paratroopers, and you are paratroopers of the 101st, and you are paratroopers of the 101st Easy Company. That is who you are. This is your identity for this task. And then as we see, not only did they have an an infused identity in who they were, but they were given specific objectives and specific commands that they were pursuing at the risk of everything. And so it was this calling which brought them to this. Common purposes pursued or similar kinds, uh, by similar, either people that were like one another or completely different from one another It didn't matter. I want you to notice the phrase at the bottom or the statement at the bottom. For Christians, for Christians, the transformation of salvation in Christ provides the ultimate common identity, purpose, and mission that can ever be experienced. I mean, band of brothers is pretty strong bond. Don't turn it over. Don't turn it over. (laughs) Fellowship of the Ring is a pretty grand story and a pretty grand purpose in this, as fictional as it may be. But when we, look at that, look at the bottom. When we think about the transformation of going from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, going from the son of of Satan, the son of the devil, the children of the devil, into the forgiveness that brings us into conformity with Christ, being called children of God, and no longer children of this present world and children of Satan. This is a massive infusion of a new identity. In fact, Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus did not come to make you nice. Jesus came to make you a new person. And so the picture is a total conversion. You're converted in your identity. You're changed in your identity. The identity of the one before salvation is different because Christ has washed over. Oh, yes, there's still aspects of your personality and your DNA and your tendencies, and many of those things may may still be there that that you deal with, either positive or negative. But the picture is, is that you have spiritually been fundamentally changed from being an enemy of God to a friend of God. And you have a greater camaraderie with other friends of God than you would even your own blood relatives that do not know God. Because this earthly relationship is going to pass away, the spiritual relationship is eternal forever. Now, there is a a glorious truth in that. I mean, we, we, we love and we pray for our family that they too would come into the greater family family of Christ in salvation, of redemption from our sins, given the standing of being called a saint and holy ones, blameless before God, only comes through Christ. But you see, notice that again, for Christians, the transformation of salvation, circle it, in Christ provides the ultimate common identity and purpose and mission that can ever be experienced by a human being. And we see this in this passage. 
I want you to see this. It's safely time to flip your page. Uh, don't want you to miss that emphasis. Look at verse 3 through 8, and we're going to quickly look at this. In verse 3, it says, I thank my God. So here he is. He's done with the greeting, and now, boom, he's out of the gate, and he's writing the letter to them, and here's the first part, the first part of the body of the letter. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, so he's looking back 10, 12, 13 years from when he first met them. Lydia gets saved. The demon-possessed girl thing happens. He gets beaten with rods because they cast out the demon. Gets thrown in jail. Earthquake comes. Jailer gets saved. I mean, things keep happening. We, we, he stays there in that city. Many others would come to faith. They're discipling. They're going through troubles and struggles. And then he goes away and he's gone on other missionary journeys. But but this is from that first, look at verse 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Look at verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So you see this, this common identity infused that has it, come to Paul, a Jew, who is also a teacher that makes his way out of Jerusalem and, and Israel, other over into Macedonia. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons the Macedonians would, would be opposed to Paul, but Lydia, also probably a Jew. The jailer, probably not a Jew, probably a Gentile. And all of these people are winding up being brought together with a common identity that has nothing to do with their ethnicity but only to do with their spiritual standing before God. And so we begin to see this letter unfold, and it just erupts in a statement of great love for them. We see something strange here. We see something that, that is rich and powerful. We see a fellowship that is real. We see something beyond friendship. We see something that is very, very deep, that has to do with troubles and struggles all the way through a common mission. We see something called koinonia. We see something called fellowship. Notice here with me, the first big thing that we need to notice is, notice Paul's grateful heart regarding the Philippian believers. And I just, I want you to underline that phrase at the very top where it says in verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Very often in Greek study, the things that are at the front end of a, of a portion of Scripture, either a sentence or a paragraph, are often the most important. Not always, but very often. And very often that's the lead idea for everything there. Similar in English sometimes. Sometimes it'll be in the middle or toward the end, but very often it's toward the beginning. And we see that this statement sets the pace for the rest um, of, these, of these near thoughts. It is his grateful heart for them. He is truly grateful for them. You see, and this is, remember this, this is on the sentence that is there, it's not on the screen, but it says, from his prison cell in Rome, Paul sees the faces of Lydia and her family, the jailer and his family, Iodia, Seneca, Clement, and the many others who were in the church at Philippi. He's just got them on his mind. And how do we know that? Because he's, he's talking about them. We, we notice in other places of the Scripture, you know, that Paul names 39 different people in the book of Philippians, excuse me, in the book of Romans alone. People in Rome, people in other places. He names lots of, he names lots of people in 1 Corinthians. He names people in every letter. These are personal relationships. And we get to see how personable the gospel is and how personable their relationships are with one another, not merely an old document with people that we can't imagine. Notice here with me, this is one big expression of gratitude. 
It's a joyful prayer of thanks amidst horrible experiences or circumstances. So it's a statement of grateful gratitude to God, and it's a joyful prayer of thanks amidst horrible circumstances. This is the first of 16 uses of the word joy and rejoice. So 16 times the word joy is going to come up or rejoice. It comes from the same root in this short letter. It is really talking about the joy of Christ. It is a glorious picture of his joy. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, we see a portion of this. We, we see this, this difficulty and joy coming out of the difficulty. Look at verse 1 with me in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Notice those two verses. These are people who, who Paul is talking about. He's writing about the Philippians to the people in Corinth. And he's saying to them, all the churches in Macedonia, you remember Philippi is in Macedonia, all the churches in Philippi or are, are, are in Macedonia are having a hard time. Look at verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. The first thing that you notice in this statement is the Philippian church has a blessed church family. What does it say up there in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, right there above it? It says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches. They are blessed by the grace of God. Even in their trouble, they're blessed. Look at the next part there. The, the Philippian church has a poor and persecuted church family. It's, it's not the big shiny Christians on the Riviera. I mean, they, 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 everything's just not going swimmingly for them. They're poor and they're persecuted. These are people under pressure. And not only that, but we also see that the Philippian church was a joyful and generous church in the midst of their poverty. And in the midst of their persecution, they're joyful. How does that happen? Because they know the values of God that go beyond the flesh and blood and time and space and circumstances that they currently see. Do you see those things there in those verses? Look what it says in verse 2. I want you to see the poor, persecuted, and joyful, generous. Look in verse 2 again in 2 Corinthians 8. Look what it says. In verse 2 it says, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance and of their joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of what? Generosity. Of generosity on their part. So they have joy and they're generous. My friends, I don't want you to miss this for the book of the Philippians. As we start to look at this, these aren't people who have good circumstances. You see, in our minds, we often think, well, if my circumstances were good, I'd be happier. If my circumstances were good, then I could be joyful. But we begin to see that from Genesis to Revelation, God is consistently saying, I am above your circumstances, and I'm calling you to trust me. And I am glorified when you trust me. Because I know the end from the beginning. I know what's coming in eternity. And I am glorified when you pursue me in faith and when you obey me in faith. This is the message of the Bible, that God is saying, come and see that I am good. By faith, trust what I've said to you, and I will show you that I am good. And so we, we, we see that he has the long-term view in mind. And Philippians can help you. Philippians can help you look beyond the present circumstances of your life, the disappointments that you have, the hardships that you have. Maybe it's even the physical pain that you have. Maybe it's the future that's unknown for you. 
Maybe it's the injury from parents or the injury from children or the injury from friends. Maybe it's the failure financially. I don't know what all the circumstances are around your life that cause you to think, well, if this wasn't like this, I could be joyful. But the Bible is making very clear to us that true faith in God and true um, understanding of His grand plan goes beyond our circumstances and fills us with a joy that circumstances cannot take away. Notice here we see in chapter or verses 2 through 8, and this isn't the second Corinthians passage. This is going back up to the box on the top of the page. I want us to read it one more time, and I'm going to point out some things to you as we go. First of all, in verse 3, look what it says up in verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. In verses 2 through 8, this is on your outline, verses 2 through 8, we get a glimpse of what every church should what? Seek to build in fellowship. Any true church should seek to be like the Philippian church in its relationship to Paul, in its relationship to each other. The, the, the true nature of a true church is that you should have true fellowship. Now, there are churches that they have a crowd, but they have no fellowship. There are people who come together And they've been doing it for years, and they know all about each other, but they do not enter into a true common identity other than the fact that we sit in the same building and we listen to the same long-winded preacher every single week. And their trial together is probably that and that alone. But when we begin to look and we see what a true church looks like, we begin to see that they have a common spiritual identity and that they have a common goal. And this brings about deep and powerful relationship that results in years of powerful memories. You see, out there to the side, I put it next to that verse 3. It says, they lived life together. That's what Paul was doing with them. And that's what they were doing with one another. But also, look at verse 4. It says, Always in every prayer of mine for you all, you all making my prayer with joy. So he is not only having wonderful memories and powerful memories of them, he is still praying for them 10 years later. He continues to pray. He is continually lifting them before God, concerned about who they are, praying for them before God. And look in verse 5. It says, and because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. In verse 5, we see this. He's still connected to them. Fill that in. Even though he hasn't been there in years, he's still connected to them. Now, we know from the book of Acts, and we also know from other letters, like, like the 2 Corinthians passage, that they, the Philippian church, was very concerned when they learned that Paul was in prison. And he was in prison in Rome. In fact, many of them thought, well, this is probably it. They're going to take Paul's life. He's now before Caesar, and Caesar is not going to budge. They are going to kill him. And so they're concerned, and they write to him. They send people to him. They're concerned for his welfare. They want to send him supply. They want to send him encouragement. They want to help him even in his state of being in prison. So he's still connected to them. Look at verse 5 again. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day, look what it says, until now. You see, these are lasting relationships. Look at verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the same, at at the day of Christ Jesus. Now, look at the next one that is here. It says that 10 years later, he is still confident of God's work in them. And underline God's work. He is still confident of God's work in them. Not their work, not his work. It doesn't say, look at verse 6, it doesn't say, and I am sure of this, that my work in you is going to bring about a completion. He's not saying what I did is going to make the difference or what you are doing is going to make the difference. Look what it says, and I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, circle the word he, that's God. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion 
at the day of Christ Jesus when you stand before God. It's going to be finally, beautifully complete. Look at the next one there in verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. He doesn't say, in my defense. He says, my defense of the gospel, in confirmation of the gospel. Not my defense of my innocence and my confirmation of my innocence. He's not even thinking about that before the authorities in Rome. What he's thinking about is the gospel. Now, there's, there's something really, really interesting here. Um, in two different places, the word koinonia shows up in a derivative form. And I skip this, but in verse 5, um, we see it. You see where it says par- partnership? Partnership is, is a, a form of the word koinonia. Do you see it out, the, out there to the side? Simkoinonos. Simkoinonos, is, you see koinonia in the middle of that. It's a fellowship. It's a deep relationship. And he's saying in verse 5, he's saying, you had a koinonia with me in the gospel. And then we go down and we look at partakers with me of grace. We have this koinonia of grace. We share this deep relationship of grace. It's beautiful how rich this is. In verse 7, we see that, and fill this in, 10 years later, they are burdened for his welfare. They send word saying, we are concerned for you. We are praying for you. And he is responding back to them saying, I don't want you to worry about me. I'm going to be fine. I am praying for you, and I'm concerned for you. So here's this beautiful burden both directions. And then look at number, the last one that is there in verse 8. Ten years later, he longs to be with them because of their bond in Jesus. He longs to be with them. Look at what it says in verse 8. In fact, let's read verse 8 out loud together. Are you ready? Here we go. Let's all read it. For God is my witness how I yield for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He yearns for them. He loves them. He misses them. My friends, this is the nature of the Christian connection when we are in Christ with one another. Now, this poor starting point group that we've just had, they have heard me rant three Sundays practically in a row about how American individualism will destroy your Christian life, their Christian life. American individualism and independence, the pioneering self-sufficient mentality that often is part of our American culture, when that is brought into Christianity, it is very, very destructive for our faith. We are called to have this kind of relationship with each other. We are called to go through tough stuff together. We are called to bond with one another in faith in Jesus and to recognize it does not matter where we were born It does not matter the color of our skin. It does not matter the accent on our tongue. It does not matter how much is in our wallet or bank account. It does not matter what degrees are on the wall or not on the wall. What matters is our common saving stake in Jesus Christ. This is what truly bonds human beings together. All of the other stuff fades away. All of the other stuff leaves us isolated. And so when we begin to see, wow, what God is really after is a true relationship with him. And if we have a true relationship with him, he has made it so we will have relationship with people that are made in his image. And this brings him glory. So I I hate to say, our front sign says for the last few weeks, Alex, probably time to update it, but the front sign for the last few weeks has a a message on it that says, no Lone Ranger Christianity. Lone Ranger Christianity is not God's design. And this is, and I know for some of you, you say, well, I've got my nice little life and I'm kind of busy and I, you know, I've kind of getting things the way I want it. And, you know, I, I have my routine. I want to sell to you, say to you, break your routine. 
Let the body of Christ in. Come join in to the body of Christ. This is where we come to really find life, real life. Well, let's apply it real quick, and then we'll go. Number one, joy is not found by being in desirable circumstances, but being in the Lord. Fill that in. Joy is not found by being in desirable circumstances, but being in the Lord. I want you, as part of your homework this afternoon or tonight, before you go to bed, to look up these verses. They're all in Philippians. So, all you have to do is turn two or three pages, okay? I mean, don't. This is not too difficult for you. Commandment I'm giving you today. Okay, so look at this. Number one, let's read it out loud together. Joy is not found by being in desirable circumstances, but being in the Lord. You're going to see in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, over and over and over again when you read the New Testament. When you read Ephesians, you're going to see in Christ over and over again. When you read Philippians, you're going to see in Christ Jesus, in Jesus, in the Lord, over and over again. Are you in the Lord? I don't care if you're in a great house or a great car or a great job or in a great family if you're not in the family of Christ. Only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Your standing with Him is what is eternal. And this is where the joy is. The Apostle Paul was in a bad place. He was in a prison, waiting on the knock on the door, saying, tomorrow's the day. And he could write a letter like this. The Philippian people were known for their joy in the midst of their poverty, in the midst of their pressure, in the midst of their persecution. They were known to be a joyful, generous people. You see, it wasn't their circumstances that they were in. It was the Savior that was in them. Is He in you? Are you learning of His joy? Number two, gratitude and joy go hand in hand. When you're down and discouraged amidst difficult circumstances, remember the works of God in your life and others. Look up at the top of the page. Look in verse 3. Look what he says. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. He is remembering what God did. He's remembering going out there to the river outside the city and starting to look for religious Jewish folks and found Lydia and a few other ladies. And God opened her heart to believe. He's remembering that. So he's sitting in that prison going, God's done works, God's done wonders all over the place. And one of my favorite churches, the people of Philippi, I remember when Lydia and her whole family became Christians. I remember when God shook the jail and the Philippian jailer got saved. He is sitting here saying, I remember the works of God and remembering the works of God lifted him above his circumstances. When you begin to remember the works of God, not only from the Scripture, but in your own life and around your own life, it is amazing how your spirit is brought joy by seeing and fixing your gaze on the things that are eternal and not the things that are passing away. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And you will be blessed singing as the days go by. This is part of remembering God's goodness. What about number three? When your life gets really hard, pray for and find a way to serve and encourage others. 
We see this in Philippians. Here's a guy who's behind bars, doesn't have internet, doesn't have texting, doesn't even have the United States Postal Service, FedEx, or UPS. But he found a way to get parchment and pen, and he found a way to do what he could do. And he wrote letters. And those letters recorded in the New Testament have been saved for 2,000 years up to this point so that people can be encouraged. I want to say to you, I don't know what circumstance you're in, but it's probably not quite as stark as Paul sitting in a prison, waiting on the knock on the door. Friends, I don't know where you are with your finances or your cancer or your broken relationships. This one thing I know, if you focus on your cancer, you're going to be discouraged. If you focus on your finances, you're likely going to be discouraged. If you focus on this ominous problem in your life and all you can think about is this broken relationship in your life or what happened to you or what was done to you or what is, a, what is coming that you don't know about, if that's all that you focus on, I promise that you will be in despair. But when you begin to see the riches of God's work in the world, and you begin to see what God has already done in your life and what he's doing in other people's lives, and when you begin to see the opportunity that you have to be used of God in the midst of your circumstance, there will come a joy that the world cannot take away. And the reason I know this is because I have experienced it myself. Friends, I want to say to you, focus. When life really gets hard, pray for and find a way to serve and encourage others and fill it in at the very end. True joy and fellowship will overflow. You won't just have enough. It will overflow. Would you stand with me for prayer this morning?